morning. Um, on behalf of uh, Michael Green, the staff and uh, members of Green's list, may I welcome uh, each of you to this morning's breakfast briefing. Uh, this breakfast is the fifth and uh, final breakfast briefing in a series of such briefings which have uh, been devoted entirely to discussions of aspects of practicality concerning the criminal law. The breakfast briefings uh, have proved over the last five weeks in the criminal law field to be uh, popular, uh, enjoyable and, uh, most importantly, informative. So we hope that uh, all of you today will uh, gain some knowledge uh, from our speakers. Today's uh, topic, as you're aware, is criminal law in the Magistrates' Court. The format uh, for this morning is that we have two speakers um, at the conclusion of which, uh, if time permits, uh, we will permit uh, uh, some questions. So if any of you have got burning questions about criminal law in the Magistrates Court, uh, I'm sure our speakers uh, will try and assist. Um, so hopefully we'll have some time at the end uh, to take some questions. Our intention uh, is to conclude uh, before 9am because we're very conscious that all of you have busy practices to attend. Our first uh, speaker is uh, Joanne Piggott. Jo was admitted to practice uh, in 1987. Thereafter, for the next eight years, she practised as a solicitor in private practice uh, in insurance uh, litigation principally before joining the Office of Public Prosecutions. Uh, she was then appointed to the position of Assistant Legal Advisor to the Chief Commissioner of Police uh, through the Victorian Government Solicitor's Office. She remained in that position for some six years before transferring to the Legislation Department of the Department of Justice. Whilst in that uh, position, she was responsible for criminal uh, matters, censorship and bills introducing stalking, extension of intervention orders, victim impact statements. Um, some of us will have um, our own ideas on some of that legislation. Body samples and contamination of products. However, um, in 19... Just excuse me. In 1995, uh, 15 years ago, she came to the bar and over the past 15 years has developed a uh, broad practice uh, in criminal law, including um, uh, magistrates' courts uh, and uh, in family law and uh, related matters. Uh, Joe will be known to uh, uh, most of you uh, as an able and experienced uh, advocate. Today uh, she is to address us uh, in respect to summary contests in the Magistrates Court um, with some reference to the uh, Criminal Procedure Act 2009 uh, which came into force on the 1st of January of this year, 2010, and which affects uh, our uh, practice of summary matters in the Magistrates' Court. So if we could welcome um, um, Joe Piggott uh, to the lectern. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much, Ian. The Magistrates' Court is um, an area which I think I always see as the grassroots, um, the very busy popular field which I think many people perhaps shy away from admitting that they've got quite a healthy practice in um, the higher courts, County and Supreme and Court of Appeal perhaps is not one that uh, is the bread and butter of many barristers and solicitors. What I thought I'd do this morning because I'm not sure how much people know or whether they've uh, attended any of the other um, <laughs> criminal uh, lec breakfast briefings in this area is to give a bit of a rundown on how from charge to contest what the procedure is 
And I have actually some flow charts which I discovered last night, which I can have emailed out to you uh, later on today, which are not included in the handout, and I do apologise for that. So I don't worry too much about the procedural side. The other aspect is once you reach the uh, contested hearing, just a few perhaps practical tips on uh, how to manage it, a few little hiccups that I've discovered in, in some of the matters that I've run uh, for those who actually intend to do their own appearance work or even if they brief out. As far as um, the getting from the charge to the contest, the Criminal Procedure Act or the intention of it was perhaps to streamline the process and in some cases bring it a little bit more in line with either the committal procedures or trial procedures. There, there are two main ways in which uh, charges get started. One is the more simple uh, matters which are by way of a notice to appear and the others are matters by summons, warrant or arrest cases which uh, commence with a preliminary brief. The difference being is that when a notice to appear is used, there's a preliminary brief served within seven days uh, and a, a, a filing of a charge seat and then it moves on to the summary case conference. That is the mandatory procedure. When a preliminary brief is served, then there may be a, may be a uh, case conference. So I've set out the procedures in the notes. The case conference is a procedure which probably is a formalisation of what actually occurred when you were down at court, perhaps on a contest mention date which is talking to the uh, prosecution about uh, the summary, making any amendments, uh, negotiating charges, for example, if there are matters with uh, a, a ham, what I call a hamburger, where there's everything from assault to cause uh, serious injury, uh, negotiating the withdrawal of those charges or, alter or some of the alternatives. That, that occurs... Um, prior to the contest mention. And in practical terms, especially if you've been down at Heidelberg Court, downstairs there's a room with a bit of paper stuck up on the door uh, with the summary case conference, and it's a, 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 an opportunity, you queue up, you talk to the, the prosecutor about those matters. There can be also requests for additional material. Important when you attend that to make I would say a clear record or, or notes of what was promised or undertaken by the prosecution and what charges. Uh, the contents of that conference is not to be disclosed in court without uh, both parties uh, agreeing to uh, the material being disclosed. It is a, an opportunity to perhaps sort out the real issues and then at that stage an opportunity to perhaps consult with your client uh, to determine whether there'll be a plea or what course of action your client is intending to take. I've set out on pages one and two the procedure for the charge sheet, for the failing to file a charge sheet uh, and, and the basic timelines. Okay. Now, one of the next major parts of the procedure is the prosecution disclosure. Um, the Criminal Procedure Act, I think, prides itself on uh, almost forcing prosecution disclosure in a much more formal way rather than perhaps the ad hoc way that we've, we've been used to matters uh, uh, proceeding. Its purpose is to promote basic disclosure at an early stage in summary proceedings, and I refer to sections 35 to 38, which refers to the preliminary brief. The preliminary brief is to contain the charge sheet, the notice about recommending and about legal reputation, uh, representation, but more importantly, a sworn summary, and this is how it dif differs from the previous you know, summary of the case, 
uh, sworn summary by the informant, which includes the alleged offence, the accused statements, possible witnesses, exhibits, and also a, a notice of any refused material. The, uh, the procedure is intended to bring disclosure both in summary procedures and committal to be pretty much the same. Section 41 deals with um, the ongoing obligation to uh, disclose material. One could be somewhat cynical um, and say that really depends on the uh, diligence of both the solicitor and the uh, p prosecution. The um, witness details and some of the material which may not be disclosed are on similar grounds as subpoenas and witness summons. A notice, if there are matters which are not to be disclosed, is to be given to the accused. Uh, if the accused requests material, the prosecution is to com comply with the request uh, for the material or serve a notice of grounds of risk refusal. And the third main element is the full brief, which in, to all intents and, and purposes is similar to the hand-up brief. Now, the case conferences, as I said, can be heard even if a, an accused has legal representation but his legal representative is not at court. And one may be familiar with the times where legal aid actually has been engaged. Uh, the accused has been sent to, sent to court to probably sit on the basis of saving costs to apply for the next date or whatever. Uh, the court will permit that uh, case conference to go ahead um, even though that their lawyer is not there that day. It's really to keep the matter moving along. Now, contested hearings. There are two main differences, and I'm referring to page five, if you want to turn to that page now. There, unlike uh, the previous procedures, there is an opportunity with leave of the court, and in 4.1 should be leave of the court for an opening or a closing address. One would presume that if the prosecution's given leave to give an opening, then that so, so the defence would be able to. Um, that is intended to relate to perhaps more complex matters or where there's uh, multiple uh, charges over a series of time and they're de designed to bring it more in line with the trial procedure. Uh, then again, the leave's required for a closing address, which is a statement of um, the, the basic facts. Uh, the prosecution also has the leave of a right to apply. That may, um, may simplify matters and as we're all quite aware it depends on who you appear for, the nature of the, the matter before the court. In, in many cases like a minor assault probably wouldn't be necessary um, and there's always a bit of a danger of, of, of going beyond the actual facts uh, before the court <coughs> uh, differs again from uh, addressing the court on a point of law which has always really been permitted. On page six I go into the procedure at summary hearings in the absence of an accused. There can be a, a course of action f uh, 5.1 where the court may direct the summons be served personally if it's, it has not already been a warrant of arrest or hear and determine the charge in the absence of the accused or again adjourn the proceedings. If the um, full brief or preliminary brief has been served, the material con contained in that may be admissible together with further evidence. So the matter can proceed not only on the material of which the accused was aware of, but any additional material that the prosecution has um, got before it perhaps obtained in, in days leading up to that, that non-appearance. However, one of the important things is that, and I've referred to 5.3, the court's limited on what it can do. So if the matter is of a more serious nature, it's more likely that the magistrate will adjourn off the proceedings uh, or, 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 
and or uh, issue a warrant of a for arrest. For, on the following page, on page seven, there is a right to apply for a rehearing, and the various grounds at 8.6 onward, 8. <coughs> section 88 onwards deal with the grounds on which that rehearing can, can occur. One of the more, more interesting aspects or more important aspects is in relation to um, summary offences where there's also a whole stack of perhaps indictable offences which are going up to the county or Supreme Court. The court must transfer all of those summary offences um, to the higher court. Previously, they were just adjourned or signy die. So you got a bit of a mess sometimes when the accused was going for trial and had these summary offences sort of floating around in the ether and sometimes they ended up cropping up at the end of, and, or, or just going off and being dealt with later. So the accused attends for one lot of cases and then has to deal with the summary offences. Once that happens, DPP has conducted the summary charges and these must be, of course, matters uh, ancillary to the, the indictable matters. For example, so, some minor charges are, are, are rising out of perhaps uh, cause serious injury or aggravated burglary, as long as they're usually in, t in the same uh, connection of time frame, incidents, etc., then they will travel up with the other offences. Once, the, uh, once there is a finding of guilt or the accused pleads guilty, the court can deal with them at the same time. The court also has discretion to move them back to the magistrate's court. And then again, that depends on the circumstances and the severity of the summary offences. On page eight, I've gone through the indictable offences which can be heard summarily. Um, there is, as you're all probably all aware, a jurisdictional limit of the magistrate's court, which is found in sections 113, 112 capital A and 113D of the Sentencing Act, uh, with a cap on two years uh, in custodial and a 500 penalty units for a natural person and 2,500 for a corporate, uh, a corporate accused. Um, if anyone's interested, there's the Kate Brookings comments in Hansford against his honour Judge Neesham, 1995, 2VR 233 at page 236 to 237. I can email that citation for you if you wish to comment on that. And it's saying whilst uh, <clears throat> these charges can be heard summarily, there is the limit. And of course, the magistrate has the uh, power to determine whether they're appropriate and may ask for the prosecution to read out the summary, consider the circumstances and deal with them there and then or transfer them along to the higher court. The, the, also, the accused must consent which is a fairly important, um, important matter given the uh, penalty ranges. Section 30 indicates that either party may apply for the court to deal with the matters summarily at any time before the court determines whether to commit for trial. Now, this could happen um, certainly during the, the lead up to the committal. It can happen before the end of the committal hearing. Um, we all know that um, sometimes the, the client's quite brave until perhaps some of the more uh, damning evidence comes out at committal and uh, perhaps has a change of heart. It's still not too late as long as the committal hearing has not com be completed. It, ca it can be offered by the magistrate um, and many common sense magistrates may view that it's easier and more practical and in everyone's interest to have it dealt with uh, there and then at the magistrate's court or either party, either the prosecution, uh, which I think might be quite unlikely, um, or the accused representative can can um, 
ask for uh, the matter to be dealt with there and then. Uh, one other important change is the children's court where all matters are heard summarily. The limitation for period for commencing proceedings is reduced to six months from the date of the alleged offence. Hence, um, you may get uh, a, a call from prosecutors panicking, knowing that they're going to be out of time and will have to have an extension of time. Um, some witnesses, often in motor vehicle matters, um, there's a bit of a run around at the last minute on those. Magistrates Court, Children's Court, they can hold joint committals for adults and, and child co-accused. So that's another interesting point. Uh, I can see that I'm va quickly running out of time, so I'll move on to just a couple of practical points. Magistrates Court, often in my experience, the accused um, is quite passionate about the fact they didn't do it, it wasn't them, or the police have got it all wrong, and they really do want to stand up there and tell the magistrate um, their version of things. Probably because it's less daunting than a uh, jury trial, probably because a lot of other factors um, have no, had not had the experience in, in the run-of-the-mill um, appearances before court. On page 10, I've run, run through a few little points and, and concluded, included some character evidence material um, because I think that's something that you, sh you should warn your client about. Often they say, oh, I've got 10, 10 witnesses that can all come along to court and say what a good bloke I am. There are some risks in uh, taking that court of action, course of action and leading, leading evidence of good character. Um, one, one point to remind the client is just before, because they don't have any prior convictions uh, is not particularly as persuasive that they are people of good character. Uh, evidence of bad character, usually admissible or inadmissible um, on the basis that it's unfairly prejudicial and it can be used, however, to negate the evidence of good character. That tends to, in my view, cloud the issues um, and it might be just a lot simpler to take your client aside, explain in fairly basic terms the risks if they go down that path um, and just run it on the facts. Now, practical tips, which may or may be uh, stating the obvious to a lot of you, a chronology. In preparing your matter for trial or for a summary contest, I've always found that doing a chronology is absolutely invaluable. It, for one thing, gives you a bit of a time frame which, and which you can cross-reference to, well, what is the other evidence you've got? Is it witness B, who was there at the same time? Uh, was it the fact that a phone call was made at the same time? And it really is quite a good way of sorting out perhaps more complex briefs. And I can, I can vouch that it actually, although it may take time, saves time and clarifies a lot of the issues. It, it tends to identify the strengths and weaknesses in a case um, and shows you really, well, we've got a big gap between, say, half past 10 and 11, what happened. The other thing is, in the magistrate's court, I feel that um, often people are rushed, briefs are, are given late, clients come in last minute, the day before major, major uh, point in the, in the hearing process. But with uh, Google Maps and um, all the streetscapes, etc., maps, plans and photographs are invaluable. And um, frequently, and I had a case recently where the police photos were of the wrong side of the road um, and put a totally different um, complexion on the buildings. There was a car, car dealership and it had some, one on some side and one on the other. Police had taken the wrong side. I wouldn't have known until the maps had come out and we, we actually saw it. So it, it does pay off. Gives the magistrate much more of an idea um, and the old saying, picture paints a thousand words. Witnesses for the defence, 
number one, never rely on the client telling you he's got all these witnesses will come along. Uh, if they're not subpoenaed, you, often they don't turn up with the excuses like my boss would, his boss wouldn't let him have the day off work, the children are sick, etc., etc. If they're important, um, subpoena does no harm. Um, once they get there, the irritation perhaps of being subpoenaed uh, will have worn off. And I think people are very loath to issue subpoenas, especially when it's meant to be the best mate or someone like that turning up. Uh, the number of times where the, the, the so-called strong case uh, ended up with just one witness, the accused. Another point, transcripts of the um, record of, of the interview. Uh, in cases where the a victim or accused has actually not sworn up very well at all to their statement, there's the trap that I've fallen into, I do admit, on occasion, on one occasion at least, where there's been agreement, magistrate says, well, record of interview going in, yep, that's fine, but the evidence that's just been given, uh, in fact, didn't relate or be anywhere near uh, what was put to the accused. Therefore, what, what, uh, what do you do? You either ask for the matter to be stood down and spend some time editing all, all the irrelevant material or unsworn up to material out of the record of interview, or perhaps even put it to, uh, to the court that they should look at that material as a prior inconsistent statement of the victim. And unfortunately, as you know, magistrates have often not got a lot of time. Um, you, you, all of a sudden, case before you folds and you're on and in the, in the running of things. But it's something just to keep in mind. I've had a couple of cases where the victims of domestic violence, um, very detailed statements, um, Warning bells should have started ringing when their English actually wasn't particularly good and it was a very, very detailed statement. Witness gets into the box and is absolutely pathetic. Yes, he hit me and that was about all she, she says. Uh, and there's page after page of page of all the um, material being put to the accused and his responses which really should go out. Other, if you feel that it might be more to your advantage to have it in, and say that it was a prior inconsistent statement, then that's a call you can make at the time. The election of the accused comes obviously after the prosecution case. Um, one thing I would say, have in the back of your mind that you always may be lucky and there might be a no case submission. Good idea is just to have your, your elements of, of the offences jot it down and tick them off. Magistrate will probably be doing the same and give it a go. Make a no case submission if you feel that it's worth it. You never know what the magistrate may have made it. Sometimes they'll interrupt you and say, don't worry Miss Piggott, I've already formed that view. But I think it's something we tend to perhaps get sometimes a little intimidated by some of the prosecutors um, or intimidated by some of the magistrates. Another issue which I think is probably very dear to um, practitioners' hearts and also I understand is mandatory if you're doing legal aid matters is application for costs. Um, try and have that as at least a rough ballpark figure uh, with you and a basis for it. Magistrates may think it's reasonable, but in matters where there have been numerous conferences, numerous adjournments, court appearances, if you can just have outlined why you arrived at that figure, you're much more likely to get it. There's a couple I've had in in recently where the magistrate said, oh, I think that's a bit outrageous, your, your client's been over service, but when we actually went down and said, look, there was this date and, and set it out, well, we got quite a bit more than we'd actually asked for. There's nothing worse than when you've perhaps surprised yourself and the uh, charges have been uh, dismissed. Um, application for costs, police want to do it there and then. Um, they're usually not happy and they usually uh, won't, won't, won't really adjourn it off. Magistrate often will adjourn it off um, for costs to be discussed, but uh, my experience 
far better to just have some some reasonable figure uh, and, and how it's broken down, available for presentation there and then. The other thing is um, also plea material. Warn your client that might not be lucky, might not be successful and get them to bring their plea material there and then on the day. Um, if you don't need it, fantastic. Uh, nothing worse than standing up and fumbling around trying to have a conference in five minutes um, after they've run the case and perhaps um, not shown themselves in, uh, in true glory. Then again, if there are perhaps some medical issues, psychiatric issues, um, by all means make, make the application to have, say, three or four weeks adjournment for, for the plea material uh, to be presented. The other thing is warn your client um, if there is a going, any likelihood of a custodial sentence and I always feel that it's best to tell them what the worst the, worst the maximum um, is so that the, then when they perhaps get a lot less than that um, they don't um, quiver in their boots or, or make some outrageous comment in the body of the court. Uh, advise them that, that there can be appealed bail and have those brief details, which usually you can chat with the prosecutor either beforehand or uh, across the bar table about whether the appeal, uh, with that, with the bail will be um, uh, opposed. <coughs> Always best, I think, to um, warn the client of the worst scenario. Get them to do a bit of the running around. After all, it's their case. And uh, a lot of them, I hate to say, perhaps have got more time on their hands than uh, many of the people in this room. And uh, the other thing is phone call, if there are any witnesses, quick call to see whether this person actually is a witness rather than just some great mate who's going to come along and say the fellow's a, a good bloke and wouldn't have done it. Um, my view is that actually running magistrates' court summary matters is probably a lot harder in many ways than the trial process because you're pressed for time. The magistrates, judge and jury, uh, often there's not the cost to prepare properly and client comes in late. But the um, essence is in the detail and I've been told it's out of time. So good luck, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, sorry to do that, but we are working to a timetable. Um, could I um, just very briefly commend to you the detail in Joe's paper um, and urge uh, uh, upon those of you um, who have not read or do not have a copy of the Criminal Procedure Act to, to get a copy, to read it, because it does set out very clearly um, the procedure in our courts. It's very helpful. It's actually an act that uh, is helpful um, to those of us that act for defendants or accused in part, particularly in, as Joe said, the uh, um, discovery or disclosure um, processes. And uh, it changes the terminology, as uh, Solicitor pointed out to me the other day, um, in um, some ways, so you need to become familiar with the terminology and the and the procedures as set out in this new act. So it's it's an important act uh, that uh, regulates the way in which we uh, act in our courts.